Welcome back everyone to the first day of the LendFest News Philanthropy Summit. If you were with us earlier today at our 11 o'clock and one o'clock sessions, we really hope you enjoyed them. We are thrilled now to have Stuart Bainham with us in conversation with Jim Friedlich, the LendFest Institute's Executive Director and CEO. Stuart, who you may have been reading a lot about recently, is a Maryland-based business person and philanthropist and is now the chairman of the Venetulis Institute. He and Jim will talk a little bit about Stewart's journey in philanthropy and the work he is doing now to launch the Baltimore Banner. Their chat was pre-recorded, so when they're finished, we'll go live with Stuart and Jim to continue the conversation and take your questions. In the meantime, please feel free to put your questions in the chat as we go, if you like. And don't forget the hashtag NewsPhilSummit. And now over to Stuart and Jim. Good afternoon. Thank you, Annie, and welcome all. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Stuart Bainham, who has been a friend, a very good friend of local journalism and a good friend of mine for at least the last year. Stuart announced, along with his colleagues, last week the launch of a very ambitious new project called the Baltimore Banner, uh, whose goal is to become the leading digital and nonprofit newsroom of the state of Maryland and, and the city of Baltimore. We want to talk about that, Stuart. We want to talk to you about your interest in local news, why local news, why news, why you believe it to be a philanthropy. And before that, I'd like to rewind a little bit to talk about you and your family and how you came to philanthropy and why it's so important to you. So if it's all right, I'll zoom out before we zoom back in. So welcome. And I should tell you, there are 700 people on this Zoom call, and they come from 10 countries, so please don't be nervous. Uh, I already am. You just made me nervous. <laughs> Jim, Jim, thanks. And, and thanks to the Lenfest Institute for ho holding the summit and allowing me to, to have a little time here with you. So much appreciated. appreciated. Tell us about the, the Bainham family and um, how you've organized your philanthropy maybe where the resources came from in the first place and how it has spanned generations, but why philanthropy? There are a lot of wealthy and successful people in this country and not all of them are as generous or as creative as you are. Well, my, my dad hitchhiked when he was 17 from Cincinnati to Washington, DC, looking for work during the, during the depression. And he became finally a plumber's helper and then a, uh, a, pl a plumber in time, a licensed plumber, and, and then developed a plumbing business. And, and it took him like uh, tw 20 years to save $50,000. He did all kinds of entrepreneurial things to put that money together. And then he built a little uh, 24 room uh, motel in Silver Spring, Maryland, and, and built up a business there. And then I came into the business later and, and we worked together for many years. And and so we had a lot of luck being two white males born in the U.S. <laughs> we, had, we had much more than our share of luck. And my dad always recognized that. Hopefully I do as well. And as a result, always felt, I mean, he formed, he formed a foundation, a family foundation for him. The family has seven foundations, but at, at this point, the different generations, but he formed the, large, the, the, the largest one that's capitalized today uh, back in, in the late 60s even. So, uh, and just put a little money in it, but, but always had this uh, a philanthropic uh, uh, motivation. Was it a part of the business? You were trying to invest back in communities that, that you cared about and where you had business interests or was it above and beyond that? It was beyond that. It was more, he, he felt a turning point in his life was his mother got him into a decent school during the depression, a high school. Now he didn't finish the high school. <laughs> he came back later after he was a plumber and he, and he finished it, but, and that was it. But uh, so he always felt that education was key and for kids that, um, uh, you know, we're often born on the wrong side of the tracks and where the schools were inferior. So that's where uh, the Bainham Family Foundation 
has invested uh, a lot of their capital. You'd said that early childhood education was a big focus. Right. If, if you could just talk about the scope across all seven foundations of the kinds of things that you've invested in in the past. Sure. Well, my my dad, I don't know if you remember this, back in the 80s, he he uh, they, they had I have a dream. I have a dream class. Do you remember that charity? Sure. And and um, and, and he he picked up a class in uh, Ward 8 of Washington, D.C., a tough, tough area, really. Uh, this is uh, to guarantee that everyone in the class went to, went to, went to college, and go went to college. college. He, he picked them up when they were in sixth grade and right. and saw it through and there's a documentary film actually on what what he did and and it's it's interesting and worked really hard a couple were incarcerated uh, young but he kept uh, tutoring them and had tutors go to uh, where they were in prison and anyway, so that that was beginning. And then uh, beyond that, he gave scholarships. The, the foundation gave scholarships to uh, kids to go away out of the inner city into uh, uh, into boarding schools. And that was we had like 1,100, 1,200 kids at one point in, in that program. But but then we decided, well, wait a minute, you get a much higher return on your philanthropic capital if you focus on early childhood. And, and, and so that's where the focus is today, largely in, in Washington, in Ward 7 and 8 in Washington, but also in, in somewhat in Baltimore as well. So that's, that's the largest capitalized Bainham Foundation. Um, my wife, two sons, and I have one. My brother, each, each of my siblings, I have three siblings, uh, have, have, have uh, a foundation as well, and, and some of the third generation Bainhams as well. The, the expression return on philanthropic capital, it's a, it's a capitalist ROI view of giving back. You had, you had talked to me and Annie about kind of your philosophy of giving and um, what you called the effective altruism movement. If you could talk to us about that, you have a, an audience here of advancement professionals and, and professional philanthropists and um, the philosophy with which you approach all this, I think, would be interesting. Sure, sure, yes. Uh, we we try to focus on high return, and when I say high return, the return is the impact of the investment on transform lives, save lives, and 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 it's and the effective altruism movement focuses on real data and trying to really project out what the return will be on this capital that's in, invested. And for example, uh, my wife and sons and, and my brother and, and his family have invested in Liberia in a, in a prenatal uh, care program for women that are pregnant with syphilis. And we've come in because we, and, and this is a pretty common problem in developing countries, especially throughout Sub-Saharan Africa. And, and we've come in uh, at, at kind of a, not the seed capital level because there's an operation up and operating, but we like it. And we think it's gonna, there's a good chance it'll be successful, but no one else is there to invest in it at this stage. And so we see that, sure, it's a little riskier capital, but the potential return, if we can prove it in Liberia is, is huge. And so, so those are the kinds of investments we're looking for that, that, you know, where there's a dearth of capital uh, being invested in, in what can be a huge uh, upside opportunity for improving the lives of people, if not transforming them and saving their lives. And uh, so that's, that, does that make sense? That's kind of the approach. It, it makes perfect sense. And so let's, let's talk about the through line from early childhood education and Washington, D.C., to prenatal care in Liberia, to local news. What is it about local news that has so captured your imagination and, and your commitment of late? And how did, how did you come to it? So, so basically, back between 1979 and 1987, I was a member of the Maryland General Assembly. And during the 90 day annual sessions, there were six daily newspapers that covered 
Annapolis, covered all the damn shenanigans going on in the legislature. And you, you had the uh, Baltimore Sun, Baltimore Evening, the, 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 the Evening Sun, the Baltimore News America, and the Washington Star, the Washington Post, and the Capitol Gazette in Annapolis. And they had all kinds of reporters down there and, and digging up what was going on and, and not finding a lot of what they should have, could have found had, had they looked harder, but they were doing a damn good job. Now there's only two of those six papers around and both of those papers have about half or less of the, of the, of the journalists in Annapolis during the 90 day session. So, you know, we're not, you know, holding our leaders to account like we used to. And this is, uh, everybody in the audience knows this. It's, it's not just the Maryland General Assembly, it's the county councils throughout the, and the city, city hall throughout the country, not to mention the zoning, local zoning board and the liquor, liquor board and so forth. So we don't know what the hell's going on. Uh, so so that, that got me interested in this uh, about a year and a half ago, May of 2020, when I was thinking, wait a minute, we're doing, we're making these philanthropic investments in sub-Saharan Africa, where a dollar goes maybe a lot further than it does in, in this country. And they're data-driven and, and it's a business-like approach. Is there something in the US where the upside is huge, where people aren't investing, where there's, no, where there's a dearth of capital being invested? And so then I started thinking about you know local news and uh, Ted Benatoulos, a good friend, had brought me this idea five years before that. And, and it planted the thought that there was, he wanted to set up a, 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 a Baltimore area local news site at the time, but he was only raising $3 million. And I thought, well, this isn't, this isn't enough to really make it sustainable. And that should be the goal that we felt that should be, and still feel that should be the goal that over time it should be sustainable. So we're not a drag on the local uh, philanthropic community forever. We wanna be a drag for a while, the first few years, but not after that. Well, let's let's come back to the notion of how to define sustainability and whether philanthropy is a permanent part of uh, of that foundation. But return on philanthropic capital. How do you measure return on philanthropic capital in journalism? What kinds of ROI are you looking for for what sounds like an investment of fifteen million dollars a year for the foreseeable future? Well, I mean. I guess there's ways to measure this over time, but it's it's difficult to to know how a, a, a people can govern themselves if they don't know what's going on in their in their community. Uh, if the stories aren't being told on one side of town and shared with the other side of town, you know, understanding and empathy go down and polarization increases. And uh, there's nothing there's nothing more democratic than the neighbors talking to neighbors, and that's missing. We don't know what the values are of a lot of the people on the ballot that we either vote for or against. We don't know what skeletons they don't have in their closet or they they do have in their closet, and uh, and and so that's the upside here. And so we're talking about our democracy. And everybody in the audience knows that. I mean, this is this is this is the potential upside is huge uh, if if we can find a way, and that's that's our goal. We have two goals: one's local, one's national. Both are ambitious. And the first goal, the local goal, is to you know tell the stories. And the the so many unreported stories that should be told in 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 Baltimore and in Maryland that aren't being told, tell those stories, hold our leaders to account, strengthen the community. The long-term goal is to do that in Baltimore in a sustainable, sustainable way. So it's a sustainable business model that then can be replicated by others that are civic-minded in communities in all, all 50 states. We, we share that goal very much between Venetulis Institute and, and the Lemfis Institute as as you know well, I want to spend a moment on the build versus buy decision that you made or that you found was being made for you uh, in your attempts to first buy the Baltimore Sun, then an attempt to buy Tribune as a whole, and then absent that to start from scratch. <clears throat> when we talk about starting from scratch, you've done so at, or you plan to do so at great scale. 
So I'll, I'll come to that in a moment, but take us through the, um, the chronology a little bit from around last November when we first met. So, so in May of 20, when I started thinking about local news in, in, the, in the US, uh, I, I brought in a consultant, Imtiaz Patel, who Jim had now the CEO, correct? Now the CEO of our operation in Baltimore. And, and so, and I interviewed a number and we liked Imtiaz the best and, and, and uh, made a great choice in, in our view and ask him, I said, okay, our goal is to go out and look at the online local news operations in the country. And let's learn all we can from them and find out what they did right, what they wish they'd done differently, what their plans are for the future. And is there, a, and, and the question was, is there a way to make a, an online news site a sustainable business model? Because that was my, my interest, was making this sustainable, like in some of our other investments. Then you get out when other capital comes in or when it's self-sustaining. Mm -hmm. So we did that and we couldn't find any with great scale. There was great journalists and some are great operations. A number of them are still going. And hopefully, you know, uh, uh, many are going to succeed for the long term and become self-sustaining. Uh, but we couldn't find one. So there was no formula that we could come up with for making this self-sustaining. So I said, OK, let's look at a legacy paper that we could convert while the advertising revenues <laughs> still were there, even though they're going down about 15, 20% a year, the secular trend and the subscription print revenues uh, going down as well, about the same a similar rate, uh, find uh, and, and convert it to a, for a legacy to a digital first operation. And so we looked at the sun and you know the story there. I mean, we got in and basically negotiated with Alden uh, we negotiated with Tribune first for about three months, and they wanted $100 million. Alden, then we went to Alden, they wanted $100 million. We said, okay, we're going to make an offer for the whole company and compete with you to take it over, because if we give you $100 million, we may as well buy the whole company. And uh, so, so that brought them around, and they agreed to a price of $65 million, and we did three weeks of due diligence uh, on the Sun, and... Um, and then they wanted to retrade the deal because they figured they'd hooked us. And we just said no. And we went back to making an offer for the whole company. I had been trying, this was in March of 21. And I'd been trying since uh, December of 20 to find a buyer for the Chicago Tribune in Chicago, which is 30% of the value of Tribune. So they have nine papers and Chicago Trib was 30, 35% of the value. And if you couldn't find a buyer for that at a reasonable price, you know, it's just not going to work. Uh, I'd end up if, 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 if even, and, and so the aspiration was then to buy the whole company, find a buyer for the Chicago Tribune, and then place the, the newspapers in the hands of local folks that would operate them as a, as a, a public good. And uh, so Mr. Wies, uh, Hans-Jörg Wies, came along and was the first one with deep pockets that really wanted the Chicago Tribune. And he and his people were first rate. We did two weeks of due diligence on buying the whole company. He was going to finance a good share of it. And then after the two weeks of due diligence, he decided uh, to take a pass. And that was like, you know, three or four weeks uh, before the shareholders meeting when the shareholders would decide who to sell the the company too. So I figured at that point, there was no, no way we were going to find the financing because I've been looking since December for five months already for a purchaser of the Chicago Tribune. And, and so we started then uh, putting together a long range plan for a local multimedia, uh, local news platform in Baltimore. Well, let's talk about the Baltimore banner. First, the, the name comes from the Star Spangled Banner, correct? Right which yeah. was written not far away. Right. Um, and this is an experiment that is distinguished in, in many ways by its scale and professionalism. The CEO, Imtiaz, is a former Wall Street Journal digital subscription executive. Uh, and the, the new, newly named editor is Kimmy from, uh, from the Los Angeles Times is 
a former managing editor of a very big city newspaper, one of the largest, and, and a Pulitzer Prize winner. You've decided to do this right if you're going to do it at all. Can you talk to us about the, the scale of commitment? And what I think is in the back of a lot of people's minds is, you know, how do we find a, a Stuart Bainham who wants to do this right in, in other cities or in, in other regions? But let's, let's start with what it is you're trying to do in the first place. One of the things we found when we did the research in the summer of 20 and the early fall of 20 uh, of the, of the uh, online news sites around the country is they, a, a number of them wish they had focused more on the business side to begin with and brought in data scientists and, and audience acquisition folks and marketing folks who understood how to listen to the customers, understood how to listen to the, uh, to the potential readers in that market. And, and so, so we decided, okay, well, that's, that's, a, that's, that's good advice. So uh, we've, we've gone in that direction. We've only hired 10 people right now. We're hiring more. We have offers outstanding for more, but we have 10 in Baltimore. Only one is on the, from the newsroom, our editor-in-chief. Now we wanted to wait to hire uh, any reporters and other editors until the editor in chief, of course, was in place. And she starts December 6. But uh, the other thing we found in uh, talking to folks around the country is that that it it's important to invest what you can early on to not just build the business side, but to build the content that all this listening by the business side tells you you need to have to satisfy the needs of the readers. And, uh, uh, and, and so you can spend, let's say you can spend, I don't know, uh, 5 million a year for 10 years. But if you spend that $50 million in the first four years, you're gonna have content. You're gonna have something really of value, perhaps if you do it right, to sell, uh, so, so you can sell subscriptions. And then to an extent, advertise. If you have the readers to subscribe, you're gonna sell some, some ads as well, local ads. So, uh, so that's kind of the, the, the approach here is it's, it's risky, but in, in my view, in a sense, it's less risky than investing over 10 years because you never really get the scale perhaps and the content that you need to really sell a lot of subscriptions. And our break even point is 100,000 subscriptions. The Sun has 85,000 digital subscriptions today and it's growing about 20% a year. So we think there's an appetite there for local news. Uh, and, and, and we wanna, uh, we, 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 you know, we'll see. We haven't sold one subscription yet. So we'll see what happens. Well, I'll buy the first subscription, so. You got over the you got over the hump. Um, is the scale of fifty people and the break even at one hundred thousand subscriptions gauged to compete with the Sun as the crosstown rival, or is it is that the number that you think and MTS thinks is a business of scale? We we don't we we don't view uh, we, our goal is not to compete with the Sun. I mean, local news is an ecosystem and, and the more local news, the better for the community. Um, there's so many stories in Baltimore that aren't being reported on. And, and, and our fantasy would be to have the sun um, grow and, and increase their market share. And we could take our capital and invest it, invest it elsewhere. So, so no, we don't see this as a competition with the sun. And Sun, Sun to a large extent, they have some great reporters. They're down to 70 reporters they have, I mean, in the newsroom versus 420 they used to have. So it's obviously a shadow of what it used to be. Uh, and, and by the way, we're talking in, in four years about 100, maybe hopefully sooner, 100 in the newsroom, not 50, but we want to start with 50, build up to 100 as we sell some subscriptions and ads and have about 45 uh, on the business side. So it's, it's roughly 150 in our projection. We'll see what happens. We are, we are going to continue to chat for five, 10 minutes, but I wanted to encourage everyone who's listening to put questions and comments into the chat so that we can 
address them in, in Q and A because we'll have another 10, 15 minutes of, of Q and A and comments from all of you afterwards. Um, just as an aside, I think Stuart, the, the job openings you haven't mentioned will probably include advancement and development as well. That's a big part of, of your world. How does it, how do you define sustainability? If do you intend to wean yourself off of your own capital and your and and the role of philanthropy altogether, or to size it in a certain way in the long run, or is it TBD? No, I, I think well, it's probably uh, to be determined. But but our our vision is that we we call self sustaining about fifteen percent of the of the total expenses of the total operation coming from the local community. If we can get it down to fifteen percent. We think that other communities and families and foundations and maybe for-profit folks will want to, well, I guess not for-profit, will want to start this up in their in their communities, something similar, if we can figure out what the map is. And, and everybody in the audience here helping us all. I mean, we're, there's no competition here. These are all separate markets and, and we just need everybody's ideas. So we're very much feeling our way. Uh, my fantasy, Jim, is that once it's a platform, so there are some platform economies. So if you get to a scale of 100,000, uh, you, 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 you can go from there and you can eliminate, we think, the philanthropic, as you expand beyond that. So you get to, a, we don't have a total sensitivity, but a rough back of the envelope guesstimate here. If you get to 125, 130,000 subscriptions, you don't, you don't need uh, the philanthropic capital. And beyond that, given the scale economies, you can keep growing and investing more and more in the newsroom. And that helps you sell more subscriptions. And interestingly, you are talking about paid digital subscriptions, not memberships with the content being free. So this is not a mirror image of say, the Texas Tribune or even of an NPR station. This is applying the commercial acumen of a paid digital subscription like MTS developed at the Wall Street Journal to a nonprofit newsroom. That's right. Like the Philadelphia Inquirer, like the Daily Memphian in Memphis, uh, like, like Ken Doctor's uh, operation in Santa Cruz Got it. and others. Tell us about what the cliche is what keeps you up at night, but what are you most worried about? What are the greatest risks do you think to your invested philanthropic capital in, in local news? What well, it used to be <laughs> hiring the wrong uh, editor in chief, <laughs> uh, but, but uh, I'm very comfortable. This, this woman, um, uh, Kimi Yoshino was our first choice. And we looked at paper on 150 candidates and, and, um, well, that we had an interest in, they didn't all apply. And I interviewed about nine MTIs, interviewed over 20. And I spent uh, 15 hours with two of them, uh, Kimmy being one. And, uh, and, and, and so, so we've got that worry out of the way. Uh, you know, one of the things we're, that I'm worried about initially is, I'm, I, I mean, we've done a, a landscape, we, we've surveyed the, uh, the media landscape of Maryland, and we're looking for partnerships uh, across the state, joint ventures where two plus two can equal more than four to deliver local news. And uh, so, we're, so that's an opportunity, uh, we think, and not so much a worry one of the things I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about is defining the scope initially of what we're going to cover with 50 in the newsroom, because you can't be all things to all people. And we've done research, uh, you know, on, on uh, what the readers want. Uh, we're going to do more research. We've got a lot of listening to do, like any good business would do uh, to, the, to the consumers to understand what, they, what their needs are. And what will so, make their lives better? Is it still, forgive me, a jump ball? Whether you have sports and, or whether this is purely public service journalism or or not? No, we're we're going to have sports. Baltimore is a big sports town, 
and and we want to cover high school sports and and uh, but we have to we have to refine all this, Jim and. And Kimmy, uh, her first day is December 6th. So now she'll be thinking about this and certainly is in the meantime, but uh, uh, we're, we're gonna have to figure this out. And so the, that, that's, the scope is a, is, a, is a big question in my mind. How, you know, I mean, I mean, on the one extreme, you could focus just on education to begin with, right? And and just do a hell of a job on education. So people that have kids that, that in, the, in that part of the uh, sit in, in the Baltimore metro area have to buy a subscription. Uh, but I think we're gonna be much, much broader than that. We just don't wanna be too broad, you know, focus counts to begin with, especially. So we, we intend to host this summit again in the future since it's been so well received and so widely received this time. If we come back together five years from now and ask you, I know I've been successful because X, how would you, how would you likely answer that? How will you know that this has worked over say half a decade? If, if other communities are trying to replicate what we're doing, that, that will be very satisfying. Uh, when we get to 100,000 subscribers at the at the at the rates we projected, uh, that will be satisfying because I think from there you can go to 150 or 200,000. You have to go across the state, but then you have some real economies and you can do some very interesting things. I I, I suspect I'm new to the business, Jim, as you know, and I'm I'm learning as I go. So um, take take what I'm saying with a grain of salt for sure. Well, thank you for that, Stuart. What has been most striking to me over the past year is the, the way in which you listen and how many times we've talked where I've said, well, you really should talk to Stephen Waldman or Alberto Ibarguin or Amanda Bennett. And you've said, well, I've already talked to them. And uh, the number of people that you have tapped into, the amount of really genuine listening that you've done, the number of times you've said, I'm taking notes, it's, it's really, not widely characteristic of, of people in your position with as much success in their lives um, in my observation. So I, I really take my hat off to you. You've been a great example and um, I think you've only begun. So good luck with the Baltimore banner. I think we're going to open up for questions now and I hope there's a lot of them and, and comments, questions and Knowing you, you'll want to ask questions of the people that ask questions. So, but can I can I deflect any tough questions to to you? With is it, can, can I do that? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I, I'm I'm happy to duck any tough question tough <laughs> questions that you don't want to duck. But um, I I think you know knowing Stuart as as I do, kind of no holds barred um, thoughts, questions, concerns, ideas. I'm sure Stuart would like to know. Um, what what people think and where they think the strengths and liabilities of of his thinking are so that's um that's up next and uh, i thank you for all your time and and all your energy and all your enthusiasm about local news and why it's a philanthropy and why it needs to be sustainable thanks thanks jim much appreciated you bet Let me just ask my colleagues if you can hear me and if we're back live again. We can yes, hear you. You're okay, live. Good. I got we're a live. thumbs up from Sharon Chan. Uh, first, um, Stuart, thank you so much for, for that. It looks like you haven't moved since you were interviewed yesterday, 24 hours ago, but you did change your shirt. So, congratulations. Yeah, you're thank moving, you. You're moving up in the world. Um, I have written down probably a dozen questions and, and, different observations. Uh, there was some lovely comments that you might, might have missed from the likes of Dick Toffel um, and Fraser Nelson, just talking about how inspiring your example is and uh, your, your willpower and your, um, 
your your creativity and 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 commitment of resources. There are several questions about the paid model. Uh, there was a question around the clarification. You're not talking about memberships. You're talking about paid subscriptions. There are questions about, hey, if I can't afford a subscription to the Baltimore banner, is it not a public service? Can I not get it for free? Um, George Rodrigue, who's a long time uh, managing editor of, uh, of the, the Dallas Morning News, and I believe uh, the Plain Dealer as well, as editor in chief asks, what is must have, must pay for local news? If it, the Wall Street Journal charge for news that helps you make money, uh, what is the equivalent in, in local news? So why don't we start with that? What is it that you will produce that is worth paying for? And then maybe what if I can't pay for it? You know, I mean, what what's more valuable to, and I said this before in the recording, what's more valuable to a community than understanding what the hell's going on in the community? And and how can you how how can it how, how can it people govern themselves if they don't know what's going on? So that's the that's the mission here is to tell the stories of the community, uh, share them uh, widely uh, throughout the community, uh, to do that at scale in a significant way. So you're covering uh, a lot more of the stories that are being covered now in most uh, local local. Uh, uh, markets, uh, you need you need to charge. Somebody needs to pay for it, and it, you know it. it so so it, in our view, it has to be subscription driven. I mean, the old business model was B two B. It was basically uh, advertisers, businesses that advertised were funding uh, local news. Uh, now it's it's uh, it's 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 consumer based. And now people that can't afford to buy a paper, uh, that's been the case forever in, in, in terms of local news. Uh, now there are local websites that are free, certainly, uh, but how much scale can they really develop over time to really cover what's going on in the community? There's 2.7 million people that live in the Baltimore metro area. And if we can, can create enough scale, tell enough stories, hold hold our leaders to account. Uh, we can improve the 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 well being of the people and that and and provide service, help them live better lives. We can provide a valuable service. Uh, we can't be all things to all people, no. But but our objective is to build it at scale, and and so it really can move the needle in a community. Presumably, as with any of the paid models at the Journal, the New York Times, et cetera, there will be a, a kind of freemium model where you get a certain amount of content gratis and then and then are asked to pay. Yeah, I mean, I'm out of my element here to an extent, but we're going to experiment with different pricing models to see what works. And, you know, our aspiration is to find a way to uh, deliver free content uh, to certain uh, uh, groups of the population, including schools and, 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 and others. There were a number of questions, Stuart, about the demographic makeup of Baltimore City versus the surrounding counties. Uh, Amy Kovac Ashley, who's with API, who does a great deal of listening to communities and uh, reflecting that in their advice to newsrooms is saying that Baltimore City is 60% is people of color, the surrounding counties uh, much less so. We have the same uh, makeup in, in Philadelphia. Uh, for whom are you publishing? Are you, what, are you statewide, Maryland, six counties, Baltimore, or Baltimore City itself? Yeah, it's, it's the metro area of Baltimore, including the counties and the city of Baltimore. And it represents just under 50% of the population of the state. It's obviously the largest city in the state. And, you know, some of these jurisdictional boundaries are pretty artificial. I mean, these people all live together in a metro area uh, and they work in different parts of the metro area often. 
And it's, it's one significant and large community uh, that share a lot of common challenges and opportunities. There was a question, several questions from Alicia Ramirez, who is asking about the fact that, that Kimmy is coming from Los Angeles, not from Baltimore, that you've brought in kind of um, a, a, a name editor-in-chief from across the country. The, the Texas Tribune just did the same thing with Sewell Chan, although uh, he had worked on the East Coast for much of his career. He also came from the LA Times. Um, how did you balance the decision between kind of hometown, well-known byline, local editor, uh, been there for years, I'm sure you had some candidates, and um, someone from LA Times? Almost all of the editors-in-chief of the Sun for the last few decades have not been from Baltimore. Uh, we, we look for the best athlete uh, in, in the country to come in. And someone, and, and this is, you know, some of the things we liked about Kimmy very much was somebody who has led, and she, had, she has 200 people under her right now at the LA Times, who has led a, a diverse, in terms of age, but also ethnicity, um, uh, the newsroom. And, uh, and, and somebody who also is very flexible in their thinking and willing to experiment and think out of the box and try new things and not be willing to fail because we have no map for what we're trying to do. There's a lot of good ideas and people are working on ideas around the country. And we're, we, we want to kind of soak up those, those ideas and, and try them in, in Baltimore. But I don't, I, I, most of our journalists will be from, from Baltimore, certainly. And the research we've done so far, and we're going to continue to do is listening to and understanding what the readers and potential readers and listeners uh, want out of a local news organization in, in the Baltimore metro area. You use the word listener, and which is something of a tell. Um, and you've talked about this being a multimedia platform, not just a digital newspaper. Uh, and, and indeed, newspapers these days, like the New York Times, are, are big podcast platforms as well. Um, there's a question from Steve Mencher, who is asking about, will you do your own audio or will you partner with a, a, a WYPR? How do you think about audio, podcasting, et cetera? Is that a solo effort or partnership effort? And how do you think about it in the first place? You know, we're, we're surveying the entire Maryland media landscape and, and talking to everybody and looking for partners uh, where two plus two can equal more than four. And so, so we're just learning as we, as we go. And uh, so stay tuned. Got it. Um, there's a question from Liza Gross, who I think many of us know as a key player in the solutions journalism movement. Solutions journalism is, of course, content that uh, that attempts to provide a solution to a problem rather than just illustrating what may or may not be the problem. And uh, she's asking specifically about partnerships with ethnic media. And um, I've actually talked at some length with uh, with Kimmy Yashimoto about this when she was at the LA Times, where she was an aggressive partner and a positive partner with, with other media in the, in the market. But this is a follow-on question to the audio question. How, do, you, do you think about partnering with, with ethnic media and um, black newspapers, Spanish language newspapers, others in the market, or are you kind of, you know, every ship on their own bottom, if you will? No, it's the former. It's the former for sure. We're talking to everybody including ethnic media uh, operations uh, in, in, the, in the state of Maryland uh, and, across, and across the state. So um, for, for sure. There's a, there's a business model question, kind of more fundamental than subscriptions versus, versus memberships, although it has the same origin from Mark Laser. Mark writes quite a bit for the Knight Foundation and is engaged in uh, a New Mexico-based and Albuquerque-based uh, news collaborative of his own. Uh, why not for profit like the Ken Doctor model or the hybrid model of the Lemphis Institute, nonprofit owning 
a for-profit but public benefit inquiry. You went full nonprofit, but you bring to this a great deal of, of commercial savvy. Why exactly this model? Yeah, I mean, we, we started out, I was agnostic about which business model to go with. There's nothing wrong with a, a, a capitalist and for-profit model. Certainly I'm capitalist too. And, and uh, the, the issue in my mind was, you know, what, what's the structure of this local news industry today? Is it an attractive structure that can attract uh, capital that can generate uh, retained earnings and capital to reinvest? And, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of headwinds, as we all know, uh, that, 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 you know, it, the space has been disintermediated by the internet and before that, I guess, to an extent by radio and TV. And so, so I don't, I just decided we, we just, and then we looked at public benefit corporation. I, hell, I talked to you, Jim, about that. And, and we learned as much as we could about, about those three different, and then the public charity. So we decided on a public charity. And part of that is just, you know, to, for this to succeed, the community has to be supportive and they have to step up, especially in the early years and especially in buying subscriptions. So, so, um, so, so we decided, you know, having, having uh, philanthropic investors, uh, small and large, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Baltimore area, as well as perhaps across the country for people that are really interested in saving local news, um, to get a tax deduction is, is a significant incentive. So it's of, public charity. Um, speaking of taxes and, and government in general, uh, there's a question from Maya Chupkov, I hope I'm saying her name right, uh, from Common Cause, asking about public support of, of nonprofit media and of, of, of news media in general. Uh, can you tell us where you have come out on the legislation that we hope will be revitalized by the Senate around tax incentives for hiring and retaining journalists? This is the local... Journalism Sustainability Act, as you know. Sure. No. No. We we I've worked on this with 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 Jim and, and Steve Waldman and others, and I've talked to Senator Schumer about it. Talked to Senator Wyden, Senator Cardin, who's at Wyden's the chair of the Finance Committee, before in the Senate. Talked to Speaker Pelosi about it, and not that I have any influence, uh, but at least we've made an effort. It's been cut out of the bill, as I understand it. The reconciliation bill at this point a, a few days ago, it may be back in today, but I kind of doubt it. Uh, so, so no, I, we're, we're all for that, obviously, because it's a, it's in the public's interest. You make a hell of a case to our elected officials that it's in the public's interest to invest and have vibrant local news uh, in communities across the country. The status of the bill is that it has not made the cut in the House Ways and Means version of the reconciliation bill. And there's a, a great hope and quite a lot of energy around trying to have it uh, reinserted into the Senate bill where uh, people like Senator Schumer have expressed their support. So it, it remains up in the air and um, albeit um, you know, somewhat discouraging at the moment. But thank you, for your, thank you for your help. I have to ask because this is, um, the fourth estate and the first amendment, the fact that you are a lifetime Democrat and came out of um, uh, the state assembly and, and have political views, how, how do you keep arm's length from the news content of the, the Baltimore banner? This is a question for any news publisher. Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, I was raised a Republican, so <laughs> I forgive I'm, you. Not a, I'm not a lifetime <laughs> Democrat. Uh, so I have that baggage, I, I guess, uh, still, uh, but, but, uh, no, I mean, I mean, we, we're, we're, we're going to have a very clear cut policy that the newsroom is the newsroom and they decide there's not a member of the public charity board. There's not an advertiser. There's not Bainham. If they want to tell me to go screw myself, they can do it. I mean, that's, that's, it's, that's just, it's the only way this is going to work. And, and, uh, and that's just, that's it. And I wouldn't be involved if I, if I didn't have that view.
Well, that's um, not surprising, but it's very good to hear and very important to underscore. I think the, the concern when a wealthy individual um, or a person of means takes control of the Boston Globe or the Minneapolis Star Tribune, or indeed uh, the Philadelphia Inquirer is that they meddle in the product and um, right. step across the line of church and state and make the product less credible. And that has, in all of those cases, not been the case, uh, thank God, and, and, and not in your case either. Um, I'm, I'm curious about, and this is an, another of Alicia R Ramirez's questions, as you begin to succeed in Baltimore and start to scale from there, on what basis will you offer your content or your business model or your platform to, to other cities? Is that a kind of open source Oh, yeah. Public charity acting on behalf of public charities or are you in the business of, of sharing that like the Washington Post does with the ARC system? Oh, no. We'll be an open book. I mean, one thing we found in going beginning in June, as I said, of 2020, going out and talking to folks in the space, uh, it's just everybody's been very open with us. I mean, I mean, Dick Tofel and, and ProPublica and and you know the Daily Memphian and and, and Doctor and uh, in Colorado all around the Texas Tribune, everybody's been very open and sharing with us what they did right, what they wish they'd done a little differently. The city in New York as well, uh, and 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 so we're. I mean, this there's, there's no. This is a local business. We're not competing with people uh, in Philadelphia or or any other city. And we're all in this together. And the more local journalism, the better for the country. There was a question early on in the queue and there's so many questions followed it that I kind of lost track of it, but from Dick Tofel, Dick, maybe you could unmute and ask the question yourself, but it had to do with how, how and why journalism is or isn't different from other forms of local philanthropy. Yeah, that, that sums it up pretty well. Jim, I mean, Stuart, my real question is when you said that you didn't want the banner to be funded permanently by philanthropy because then it would be a drag on the community, presumably the museums aren't, the hospitals aren't, the universities aren't. So why would the banner be a drag? I, I, I think we have to ask the philanthropist that question. I don't think it should be. Uh, a drag. I think I think local news should be is a very you know um, <laughs> worthy charity for philanthropists and foundations to invest in. But I don't think I mean Dick, you have a much broader view obviously than I have, and I'm new to the space. But I don't think that's happened sufficiently uh, compared to the capital going into educational institutions and museums and the arts and so forth. And there's a dearth of capital. The, 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 reason, the reason we're in this, my wife and two sons and I are in this, is because there is a dearth of capital and there's a huge upside. And, uh, and, and if we can help prove a sustainable business model that can be replicated across the country, then we can, we can get, get our capital out, invest it some other place. Uh, but, you know, I, I just don't know that while the demands there uh, for philanthropic capital uh, for local news, I'm not sure the supply of the capital has, has I don't think it's been there over the years to a, a, a significant enough degree. Yeah, I mean, to the as an initial matter, I just want to say I completely agree with that. My hope would be that when you start at this kind of really important scale, and I think you're you're making a really big statement and a good and a great one with that, that other people will come behind you philanthropically and that it may or may not be possible to sell the subscriptions, but that there is a plan is or ought to be a plan B that if you can attract many, many readers, but not many subscribers, there might still be a viable path that way. Yeah, but but how? Yeah, is that but is that that's going to be a lot harder to replicate around the country if that's the case, right? If, if, if we can make this self-sustaining uh, to a large degree, as I said, uh, then, 
then I think there are families and philanthropists in communities around the country that'll step up and say, well, wait a minute, here's the map for making this sustainable. So yeah, we'll put capital in for the next few years, but it won't have to be for 15, 10 or 15 years or, and longer. I mean, that's maybe I'm, you know, overly uh, optimistic and naive. Uh, maybe to, we're feeling our way. Well, maybe to square the circle on this, I, I remember, Dick, when you and Paul Stogger started ProPublica, the big question was, you know, where do you go beyond Herb Sandler? You have this one extraordinarily visionary and, and generous um, benefactor. And uh, I believe you raised over $200 million in addition to uh, Herb and, and, and family. Uh, the same question arose with the Lenfest Institute. Uh, Jerry was very clever in offering matching funds, uh, which translated to $40 million of matching funds if we could match it, which we did. So I think the, the presence of a single major benefactor, if well executed, actually results in, in more capital. This is separate from what you were asking, but I think Stuart is, is potentially in that position. Uh, we just have a minute left and I wanted to just touch on a couple of things that are, are big takeaways here, Stuart. First, thank you and, and thanks for your inspiration. I'm sure this is not the last conversation we'll have. You're always very candid about both your aspirations and, and any mistakes you might make. So I think we'll, we'll be learning together. Um, the second is this notion that there is a dearth of capital focused on local news, particularly local money for local news, as opposed to national money, we need both. Um, that one needs to invest very substantially upfront in order to seize the day and, and address the growing crisis in local news and to build good businesses. So in that sense, it's just like any other business, a go big or go home. Um, that I think is a great message for people in the business of fundraising and advancement, which is what this conference is all about. So thank you for those lessons. Thank you for everything that you're doing. And thank you, Annie, for inviting me to uh, interview Stuart. Jim, could I, could I just say one, one last thing here? You bet. I mean, the audience, probably most every member of the audience here knows this business much better than, than I do, certainly at this point. And, and so if you have any ideas or suggestions, uh, and, and these questions have been very helpful, believe me, they've stimulated my thinking, I, I'd ask you to, to reach out and pass those thoughts along. If you see us kind of stumbling off in the wrong direction, reach out as well. But any ideas, we're, we're all in this together and, and it would be very appreciated. And thanks, thanks, Jim. That's a lovely thought. Thank you. Thank you, Jim and Stuart, for a terrific discussion. And I think it all circles back to something Sharon said this morning, a rising tide lifts all boats. We are all in it together for sure. Hope you all enjoyed this session. We're going to close out the day with three more sessions at four o'clock, including prospect development systems for newsrooms with Suzanne Larson from Mother Jones and Emily Spranger of INN, Innovating Out of Crisis, How Black Publishers Are Creating New Opportunities with Eleanor Tatum of the New York Amsterdam News and Nancy Lane of LMA, and a community chat on the special nuances, challenges, and opportunities of for-profit fundraising with Rusty Coates of Journalism Funding Partners. Don't forget that the movie Storm Lake is on at seven o'clock tonight, a preview for all of us. If you can't make it, it will be available on demand through Friday, when of course we'll have a panel discussion with Art Cullen and the filmmakers as well. And please don't forget to complete our very simple fundraising survey, which I think was sent to you this morning. And we look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks again, Jim and Stuart and everyone for coming. Thanks, Annie. Bye. Take care. Thank you, Stuart.